Hey folks, uh, welcome back to part two of this. Um, I tr I've been trying to split these talks into 20 to 30 minute chunks so it's not too overwhelming and so you have time to see them. So um, I'm gonna share the screen and then we'll go from here. Share screen. There we go. Oh, full screen. All right, this is where we ended last time. What's the brain made up of? We talked about the construction of neurons and glial cells and synapses in the human brain. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about the complexity. I love that picture on the top right. Those little dots that you see everywhere, those are connections from other neurons onto a single cell. And the complexity of a quadrillion synapses is pretty overwhelming. So do we just give up? And at one point we kind of started to. There's a fairly disturbing image of Walter Freeman performing a prefrontal lobotomy. Um, yet they didn't quite know what they were damaging and what they were messing with was the prefrontal cortex of the brain. And we'll get to that in a latter lecture. Um, but no, but it raises an interesting question. If you look at this complexity, how do we figure out what it does? Well, first of all, let's back up a second. What does the brain do? We can split this up into information distribution, meaning information is coming in and it gets processed in multiple places. And there's a concept of topographic organization, that organization within the cortex itself is arranged by where things are coming in. For example, if I dropped a brick on your foot, your brain would recognize, oh, that was my right foot, not my left foot. And that's mapping in the brain where information is coming from. And we have information processing, divergence and convergence. Divergence means it splits and goes to multiple places. Visual information is a great example of that. Um, visual information, we talk about going to the occipital cortex in the back of the brain, but it also goes to many, many other places. Um, the hypothalamus, um, the basal ganglia, all sorts of other places for recognizing information. Convergence, meaning things are coming together. Excuse me, I'm about to sneeze. Um, meaning the information is coming together. So we talked about this in our last discussion of baseball and the convergence of sensory information to make a decision. So olfaction, vision, internal information coming from within the body, um, sensory information from the muscles, knowing where we're standing. And all of that converges onto a decision to do something. And all of that is topographically organized as well in the human cortex particularly. And that's all well and good, but how do we figure this stuff out? Oops, wrong slide. So you can imagine back, and this, the picture on the right is from Vesalius's 1543 textbook, um, first medical book as far as I know that ever truly identified anatomically the parts of the brain and he labeled most things. But if you think about it in 1543, preservative wasn't around, x-rays weren't around, CTs and MRIs certainly weren't around, and the concept of neuronal functioning didn't happen until the 1940s. So we're 300 years, 400 years, um, before any of that basic knowledge was understood. So what do you do? Well, the first thing they did is they all became anatomists. They opened things up and they looked at everything. And the first thing they noticed <clears throat> was there was these huge spaces in the brain and nobody knew what they were for. They figured out that fluid drained out of them, but they didn't have any idea. So there was a number of, this is from the late 1400s, um, where they thought that that's where the emotions were held, were in these spaces here. We now know that, of course, that's filled with cerebral spinal fluid, and it travels up and down the brain, and we'll talk about that in another, at another time. 
um, but I always show this picture from Vesalius for a very different reason. Because he doesn't really label anything. You can't really say, oh, there's the prefrontal cortex. Um, and there's the occipital cortex back there. I actually do this as a good reminder. And I, I, I've used this picture several times in graduate level classes to remind students, what do you notice that's unusual that you'll never see in a textbook? How about a mustache and a nose? And it's very humbling and a, a good reminder that these are humans we're looking at. And it's very near and dear to our figuring this out. When people opened up the cranium, nobody had any idea what it was. And if you've ever seen fresh brain tissue, it's semi-hard jello. And there was a lot of theories on what the brain did. Was it a thing? Was it a bunch of things? Nobody really quite knew. And Camille Golgi and Ramonica Hall were brilliant, brilliant anatomists, and they benefited, as have a lot of scientists, by technological in, in, uh, inventions. And in this case, it was the microscope. And Camille Golgi um, studied connections of the, the, so let me back up a second. There were two theories on the function of the brain. There was what was called the reticular theory, that the brain was a single, giant, interconnected, kind of Borg-like activity. And the other theory was the neuron doctrine, that the brain was comprised of individual cells that reach up and contact each other, but interact as a integrated network of individual cells. And this was fairly disputed until these guys really got on to the microscopy. And Camille Golgi developed a Golgi stain. And in fact, if I walked out of my office into my lab, I could go into my refrigerator and find Golgi stains, because we still use them today. And these are cells, they're called Purkinje cells in the cerebellum. And they have this huge brush-like connections that go out and project everywhere. But what Camille Golgi said was, wow, it looks like they're coming up and they're stopping. So they might be connecting to other cells. And Ramonica Hall studied primarily the, the cortex of many animals. And here's a layer from the cortical, uh, a, a section from the cortical layers. And you can see these cells with these huge outreaching dendrites, these huge branches. Um, and they project up and they communicate with the ones above them. And this was pretty much of a landmark set of studies between these two folks to say, you know what, the neuron doctrine is really true. These cells are not an integrated single mesh or a single network, um, but they're individual cells talking to each other. And they ended up winning the Nobel Prize in 1906. Um, but they didn't know how they communicated with the other cells. And then in um, the 1500s, early 20s of the, the 20th century, a fellow named Charles Sherrington wrote a book called The Integrative Action of the Nervous System. It's a brilliant book. It's actually a, an easy read if you ever can get, a, get hold of it. Um, most university libraries have a copy of this. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. And he had this interesting quote, to move things is all mankind can do, whether whispering or felling a forest. The motor output is the only external output channel of the brain. What was fascinating about this is Sherrington did his initial experiments on dogs. And you can do this at home, sort of. If you take a dog, you probably do it with a cat, but dogs are a lot easier. And you tickle a single hair on the bottom of their paw and they'll retract their arm, right? We all know that. So he was able to, do, to take that a step further he was able to calculate the conduction velocity, meaning how fast the signal is going to move up the leg of that dog. And if these neurons were all connected, he estimated that it would take about 10 milliseconds for that signal to go from the paw up to the spinal cord to activate the muscles to pull the limb up. When he actually measured it, it took two orders of magnitude longer than that. 
and he said, something is slowing this down. And we don't know where the yield signs in the nervous system are, but I'm gonna call it a synapse. He didn't know about Camille Golgi and Ramon Hall at the time, but he said, there's something that's slowing this down. And that was a really a landmark paper. And he ended up um, sharing the Nobel Prize in 1932 for that work primarily from his book. And so that's all well and good. And we can talk about that all we want. But what about the concept like emergent properties? Like abstract thought, memories, emotions, morality. How do we figure those out? It's a little bit more complicated. The first attempt was in the late 1700s, very interesting study on the philosophy of science. A guy named Franz Gall came up with this idea of phrenology, and it makes theoretical tremendous amount of sense. We know if we exercise a muscle, it gets bigger. And we know if we exercise that muscle, the bone gets stronger. We grow muscles, we grow bones. Why can't we grow the brain? And while that's true now, it's not true in the way that Gall thought it would be. He thought if the brain expanded cellularly, it should push on the cranium and you should get changes in the cranium in shape. So he did a whole bunch of psychological testing and then measured the shape of people's brains. And then he categorized them all. This must be the area for hatred, for abdominal organs, for vagrancy. I mean, it's, it's obviously kind of silly, but it was based on a, a very logical premise that now we know is not true. And if you're bored, you can go to eBay or Google, and you can still find phrenological busts that label all of these sort of things. It's, it's kind of wild, but it's a fascinating um, bit of, of history. Then the scientists started realizing, well, we can't do these experiments. We can't take people's brains apart while they're still living. And when they're dead, we can't physiologically understand what they're doing. So this is probably the most famous case in, in neurology ever. And I don't know a single neurobiology person who doesn't talk about Phineas P. Gage. And because I'm interested in the history of this, um, I actually was able to get hold of a, the original newspaper clipping. And it says, a horrible accident. As Phineas P. Gage, a foreman on the railroad in Cavendish, was yesterday engaged in tamping for a blast. So they were building railroads. And what they have to do is get, you know, break the rocks apart. So they drill a hole down. They drop gunpowder down. They tamp it with cotton. And then they explode it, and it breaks the rocks apart. So as he was tapping for a blast, the powder exploded, carrying an iron instrument through his head, an inch and a fourth in circumference and three feet and eight inches, eight inches in length, which he was using at the time. The iron hit on the side of his face, shattered the upper jaw, and passing back of the left eye and out of the top of the head. And then this is my favorite quote of this article. The most singular circumstance connected with this melancholy affair I wouldn't call having that going through your head melancholy, but whatever, is that he was alive at two o'clock this afternoon and in full possession of his reason and free from pain. In fact, as the story goes, he picked up his rod, went to his boss and said, I've kind of had a bad day, can I go home? And so he walked home. And there's this great quote in there that was from someone who studied him. Before the accident, he'd been, been their most capable and efficient foreman, one with a well-balanced mind, he was now fitful, irreverent, and grossly profane, showing little deference for his fellows. And they've done CT scans now of his skull. His skull, I think it's at the Harvard Museum, uh, Medical Museum, I'm not exactly sure, I don't remember, and showed exactly where it went through. Now, it took out his left eye, and it went through the pr frontal cortex, and then out the top of his head. And this was obviously a very sad affair for him, but the scientists are going, wow, now we have an idea. Because the idea for many, many years was the brain was a single organ. And now people were starting to get to the idea 
that maybe individual components of the brain are doing individual things. And this was a very novel thing. So, <coughs> excuse me, then scientists at the time began looking for people that exhibited disorders. And Paul Broca was probably the most famous for this. He had a pay, he was a medical doctor. He was in London, I think. I know he was in Great Britain. Um, I think it was in Great Britain. Paul Broca ran into a gentleman named Laborge, but everybody called him, called him Tan, because that was all he could say, it was Tan, Tan, Tan. And then there's not much you can do at this point. You know, they didn't have CTs, they didn't have MRIs, they did, certainly didn't have, you know, contrast x-rays, those sort of things. So you kind of wait around until they died, until you can do the dissection. And here's an actual picture of Tan's brain. And sure enough, there's a huge vascular lesion right there. You can see a little bit of it here, and there's a little bit in the back. Um, but the, the left hemisphere is, is severely damaged. And he found another, a number of other patients after this that exhibited this sort of speech loss. And he identified speech down to this particular area, which is now known as Broca's area. And it's for the language production. Language comprehension was still intact. If you'd asked Tan to do something, he could comprehend language, but he couldn't understand, I'm sorry, he didn't have the ability to produce that. And so later, another scientist by the name of Wernicke identified this area in the back from people that were producing, what, oops, sorry, what are called word salads or the inability to comprehend their own speech. And that's now known as Wernicke's area. And this is on the left hemisphere, primarily, not always. Um, folks with damage to the left hemisphere sometimes can shift that to the right. And there's a certain percentage of the population, albeit very small, that Broca's area and Wernicke's area are on the right hemisphere. So this is a very famous experiment that was done, goodness, probably 30, 35 years by now, where they hooked them up to a CT scan and they had them passively viewing words. So looking at these words on the screen, Paul Broca, 1824 to 1880. And there's a few areas that, that light up, but the primary area is in the back, an area known as the occipital cortex. That's visual recognition that gets converted up and then, if, then when they listen to words, without looking at them, the occipital cortex didn't light up, but guess what, this area did, and you know what's right down in here? Shocker, the auditory cortex. When you had them start speaking random words, now we have the motor cortex. So this line right here is the central gyrus, and here you see the motor cortex is lighting up. But when they generated words on their own and had to recognize that they were generating them, um, they had the premotor cortex and parts of the auditory cortex were lighting up so that they knew they were generating. And here's Broca's area, and here's Wernicke's area. All right, so back in the early 1900s, epilepsy was a very, very debilitating illness. Nowadays, there's much, much better medication to prevent this. It's still a problem, but it's not as devastating as it was back then. <coughs> Excuse me, and Wilder Penfield was a neurosurgeon, and he wanted to figure out if there was a way to get around epilepsy, because these people are basically non-functional. So he figured out that if he cut the connection between the two hemispheres, that epilepsy went down tremendously. And that connection is called the corpus callosum. Um, but there's something really interesting about neurosurgery. Is there's no pain perception in the brain, and he had to know exactly where he was at all times. So he would go in and stimulate parts of the brain 
on the way down to make sure what he was affecting so he didn't cut something that would damage um, the wrong thing. And so he was able to identify by stimulation of mild electrical stimulation, a whole bunch of parts of the brain. And because of these epilepsy surgeries, he was able to be physiologically demonstrate what anatomically had been shown by Broca and Wernicke and all these other folks. And at the same time, working in concert with this was a fellow named Corbin and Brodman. I think he was Russian, but I'm not exactly 100% sure about that. And he was a brilliant, brilliant neuroanatomist. And he took the cortex of many, many animals. And he said, if there is in fact a separate function of these parts of the cortex, histologically, they may be slightly different. And so he was a very, very articulate histologist and anatomist and a brilliant microscopist. And so he separated the human brain and he did this with dogs and cats and lots of other animals. And he was able to identify that this part of the brain is histologically different from that part of the brain. And he numbered them all. If you ever heard of Broadman's numbers, that's what they're talking about. And now we know that, for example, that part that's right in front of the central gyrus is the primary motor cortex. And right on the other side is the primary sensory cortex. Right back here is the occipital cortex, which we've already talked about, areas 17 and 18. Those are for the conscious perception of vision. There's the auditory cortex sitting right in there. And here's the prefrontal cortex. So the combination of all of these scientists together really led us to understand there's the primary auditory cortex, there's the brainstem, that one was easy. Primary visual cortex, Wernicke's area, and so on and so forth. We've already talked about all of these. Um, and now the structure of the brain was beginning to become fairly understood. And that comes back to this diagram on how that works in the brain. But we've already been through that and I'm not, not going to do it again. Okay, just as a reminder, we have this plan on what we're going to do. We have a state on the condition of the brain and we have generating neurons that are bringing it about. How do we go about doing that? Um, and this, oops, hang on a second. Okay, sorry about that. Um, how do we go about doing that? We build maps. I'm gonna show you a little bit about how we build those maps. This is from a bunch of my research over the last 20 years, and we've built boxes. Here, for example, is the reticular formation for the generating, in this case, feeding output. But in order to generate a feeding output, we have to have connections with the tongue and with the mouth, and we have to know where that is. People in speech pathology talk about this all the time, the placement of the tongue. Well, for feeding, we also have to be very interested in that. And so we've spent a lot of time producing these diagrams of this here is vision coming in to activate, oh my goodness, that looks like something we want to eat. Here we have, olf I'm sorry, that's olfaction. Here's vision coming in, that smells like something we want to eat, that looks like something we want to eat. And we have to have sensory information that's going back to control these, so that's the state, the plan. And to end, almost end, this is kind of my philosophy on neuroscience. This is from a beautiful play written about 20 years ago, I think, by Tom Stoppard called Arcadia. It's a, it's a beautiful play, you should read it. It was actually about physics. Um, the quote is, it makes me so happy to be at the beginning again, knowing almost nothing. People were talking about the end of physics. Relativity and quantum mechanics looked as if they were going to clean out the whole problem between them. A theory of everything but they only explain the very big and the very small. The future is disorder. It's the best possible time to be alive when almost everything you thought you knew is wrong. And that's kind of how we're thinking about neuroscience, but it's a beautiful evolving field, but it's also 
very, very new. You know, the neuroscience, the Nobel Prize for the understanding the um, functional activation of the action potential was just a hair over 60 years ago. So we're just beginning to understand. And I'm just going to talk very briefly about how we're going about doing that. Um, here's just some pictures. Um, this is all out of my lab. These are for Kinji cells from the cerebellum. These are pattern generating neurons that we know are reaching out. Here are neurons that are activating motor neurons. There's some other pretty ones that are affecting the motor output. Um, and here we see convergence. We talked a lot about the reticular formation. And here you see the convergence. There's a picture of the reticular formation showing you the density of neurons that are going through that. Um, this is also for my lab. And if you focus on these individual cells, you'll see these are two different colors. One is olfaction and one is vision. And these are both converging on the same cell to produce an output. Nowadays, we have the use of an fMRI, and they're allowing to isolate. So the theory is that when you activate a part of the brain, you increase blood flow to that area. That's been the basis for CT scans and MRIs and functional MRIs for many years now. And when they had control of a cursor, which controlled spatial movement, it lit up parts of the brain like the cerebellum. So now we're making tremendous strides. And this is kind of a dated figure because the resolution has gotten a lot higher. Um, and now we have so many different things. Single photon emission computed tomography. There's so many different new technologies out there, most of which I don't quite understand fully because it's just so complicated. You have to really specialize. And they can diffuse various tracers and the image intensity is related to certain things. And so for example, um, cocaine abuse. There's a global reduction in cerebral perfusion and especially in the temporal lobes it's um, affecting that and in depression there's a redu reduced perfusion to the frontal and temporal lobes and this area up here in the brain we know is involved with sociality and morality and um, executive and attention functions um, executive attention i should say attention to self and so those would go away quite a bit. So the future is really, really bright in the function of the human brain and our understanding of how the human brain works. And hopefully I'll, we'll provide you another um, set of data soon with some of our work on electroencephalography of the human brain. But right now with um, the strangeness that's going on, we can't do those experiments right now. So I'll end with that. And um, if you have any questions, I never posted my email address. It's A-N-D-E-C-U-R-T at isu.edu. Um, drop me an email if you have any questions, if I can help do anything. Um, I'm, I'm available all the time. So enjoy the rest of your day, whatever day this might be for you guys. And I will talk to you next time.